Today is the last lecture of the 75th semester, so don't come next week. Come back one week after Labor Day. We'll be back September 8th. This being the last week, I want to especially thank the donors who make the series possible. This series is funded entirely by donations from a handful of people. So let's give them a round of applause. I'd also like to thank Brad Deerwood, our volunteer coffee maker. Where did you go? Brad? Our speaker today is from Seattle. She got her bachelor's degree at MIT and her PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she worked under Joel Primack, who some of you may remember. He spoke here just last year. She's done postdoctoral research in Michigan at the University of Chicago, where she held a prestigious Hubble Fellowship and also a Fermi Fellowship. And she's now an assistant professor of physics at Stanford University. And she's here to tell us about her work in cosmology. It's called Lighting Up the Dark, Galaxies as Probes of the Dark Universe. Dr. Risa Wexler. Thank you. And, uh Great to see such a great turnout here. Um, I know it's a mixed audience, and, and I won't be able to speak to all of you at all times, so I encourage you to uh, interrupt if I lose you, and I'm happy to slow down and uh, back up and anything like that. So, so uh, I want to talk to you uh, about sort of the modern view we now have of cosmology, which is kind of amazingly different than it was even when I started graduate school. Um, the amazing state of affairs that we find ourselves in is that even though most of what we see looks like this, that's not even close to what we think the universe is actually uh, made of on the whole. And this uh, cover slide that I have here, hopefully you'll understand by the end, uh, these are the kinds of simulations that, that me and my group uh, do to try to understand uh, this galaxy distribution. So the first thing that you see, if you look up out the sky with a very, very, very powerful telescope, uh, is something that looks like this. This is uh, the deepest image ever taken of the sky uh, from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. This is the ultra deep field from the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> and you can see just this vast diversity of galaxies, um, lots of different kinds of galaxies, lots of different shapes and colors, and lots of empty space in between. Um, so one of the things we want to do as cosmologists is figure out why this looks like it does. And one of the other things we want to do is try to understand how taking pictures like this can help us understand even bigger questions, like what is the universe made of? How did it begin? What is its ultimate fate? So those are the kinds of things that I want to talk about today. Um, one of the sort of next most important facts that you notice uh, about the universe, if you go out and observe it, is that it's not smooth. It's not the same uh, everywhere. Galaxies are not actually randomly distributed in space. The universe is very clumpy. And that's really essential for understanding pretty much everything, because we wouldn't be here if the universe wasn't clumpy. You can see that clumpiness. Uh, quite, quite vividly in this picture. This is a picture of the galaxy distribution in the very local universe. Uh, well, local by a cosmologist standard. So, <laughs> um, so this is uh, out to a redshift of about 0.1, uh, which is just a fraction of what we can now see uh, with, with very powerful telescopes. It turns out there's a, there's a totally different way of looking at the universe that allows us to see how clumpy the universe was just 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And this is the picture that I'm showing here. Um, I won't have time to talk about all of the really phenomenal and exciting details of this picture, but the main thing that you need to know is what this picture is showing you is what are the density fluctuations in the universe at these very early times. And the other very key piece of information about this picture is that Actually, if you, if you just take this picture, it looks completely smooth. What I've done here, what the 
uh, what's being done here is that the fluctuations in the universe at this time have been blown up by several orders of magnitude. And so the, the tiny little spots that you're seeing here are actually fluctuations of one part in 100,000. So globally, the universe is actually very, very smooth at early times. Um, but if you blow those fluctuations up, these tiny fluctuations form the seeds of all of the structure that we know today and that uh, clump that make, make the clumps that we see in the previous picture. So, and we'll talk more about this. So, a third fact uh, that's sort of critical for understanding uh, our current universe is that the universe is expanding. Okay? This has now been known for well, close to 100 years. Um, first discovered by Edwin Hubble, he was the first to realize that those fuzzy blobs that you see in the sky are actually distinct galaxies. Okay? And his breakthrough um, came about through something that's actually still quite critical in cosmology, is a way to measure accurate distances. Okay? So what he, what he did was he, he looked um, for something which we now call in cosmology standard candles. Basically, the idea is to find some object. It's kind of like a 60-watt light bulb. If you put it far away, you know how bright it is. Okay, so that's what he did. He found a kind of object called Cepheid variable stars, whose absolute brightness is, re is related to, their, to the period of their variability. And then, if you can measure that period, measure their absolute brightness, then the apparent brightness, how bright they actually look, tells you something about their distance. Okay. You can think of them just as, as light bulbs. And so he measured this diagram of the velocity of galaxies as a function of their distance from us and showed that that was proportional. That indicates that the universe is expanding. The things that are farther away from us are moving faster and faster away from us. Okay? And I, I, I wanted to bring this up in particular, not only because the expanding universe is one of the most basic facts of the universe, but because it's the same kind of technique that helped us discover one of the main components of what we now call our dark universe. Okay, so the discovery, uh, which happened in nine, roughly in 1998, although there were clues before that, is that the universe is not just expanding, but that the rate of expansion is increasing. So the universe is actually accelerating in the present day. And this is a very strange state of affairs, which no one really would have predicted. And the basic idea here um, is, is that similar measurements were made to the kind of thing, it, similar in spirit with a different kind of object, to the kind of thing that, that Hubble was measuring with Cepheid variable stars. In this case, you want to go something, you, you need something that you can measure much, much farther back in the universe. And one good candidate is uh, supernovae, very, very massive explosions. Okay, so there's a particular kind of supernovae type 1a supernovae that has um, fairly well understood, in some sense, uh, expansion, uh, uh, luminosities. Okay, so basically what, what you can measure, you measure something about how the light in these explosions increases and then decreases. And the, how long that time takes tells you something about their absolute brightness. Okay, so that was the breakthrough uh, that happened just about 10 years ago. And the big surprise um, from these measurements was that they indicated that the universe is not slowing down, which is what you would expect if it was only made of normal stuff. Matter, basically, gravity attracts. So if you have matter, it will pull other matter to itself. So the only thing gravity can do is slow the universe down. And instead, something else was discovered. We found out that the universe is not slowing down, it's speeding up. So this plot shows the relative brightness of the supernovae going back in time. Redshift of 1 corresponds to when the universe was half of its present size. Okay? So what is found is that the universe was slowing down for a while, and then something, something speeded it up. Okay? So this is one of the main facts that we're now confronted with that we need to try to understand as cosmologists. Um, a second uh, very puzzling thing is that it turns out that if you try to add up all of the stuff you can see in the universe, 
It doesn't come anywhere close to explaining essentially the, the dynamics of the universe. And that's true on a very wide range of scales. It was actually first pointed out in the 30s by a man named Fritz Zwicky who looked at the motions of galaxies in clusters. By measuring the motions of those galaxies and clusters, he was able to infer something about the mass of those clusters. And he, he found that they needed a lot more mass than he actually saw in the galaxies. Um, the thing that's, that's most popular for showing this extra mass is looking at the rotation curves of galaxies. So this is just an example pretty picture galaxy. This is our nearest neighbor, a big galaxy, Andromeda. But generically, if you look at the rotation curve of a galaxy, you find that if you drew what the rotation curve looked like as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy, if you, look, if you draw what you would predict it to look like from looking at the light distribution, you would predict it would fall off. Okay? So basically, the amount of stuff in the, in the galaxy as a function of distance tells you how fast it has to rotate. And what we find when we measure these things is that they're basically flat, going all the way out. And that's telling you that some extra stuff has to be making up this difference. Okay? So there has to be some extra stuff here that we're not seeing in the stars. Another example of that, of this kind of extra stuff, which we now call dark matter, um, comes from looking at uh, collisions of a, a very massive cluster. So this was, a, this was an observation, or actually a, a set of observations, um, taken by a number of people, including people at, at KIPAC at Stanford, um, of a merging cluster of galaxies. So you'll hear more about clusters of galaxies in this talk. But these are two very massive um, groups of galaxies. And when you have a very massive group of galaxies, you not only have galaxies, but you also have a lot of hot gas, very high temperature gas. And what is shown in this picture is two separate measurements plotted on top of the galaxy distribution. So in the background here, you see the galaxy distribution. The blue is a way of actually measuring the mass distribution using something called weak gravitational lensing. And if I have time, I'll talk more about how those kinds of measurements are done. But what's shown here is that you can use that. It's essentially looking at the distortion um, that the mass gives to the light of background galaxies. You can use that to get a picture of where the mass is. And then you can use x -ray, an X-ray satellite to get a picture of where the gas distribution is in these clusters. And what you find, the, the key point of this plot is that they're not in the same place. So just showing you this movie again, this is just a simulation uh, made by a student at Stanford, John Wise, um, of how this might have happened. So what happens is that the gas, because gas particles, when they hit each other, they can cool down and then heat. Lots of, lots of thermodynamics can happen, so they, don't, they, they run into each other and, uh, and, and form this. This is called the bullet cluster because of this, what looks to be a merging bullet coming through. The dark matter doesn't interact with itself, and so it goes straight through. Okay? So the main point here is that these things are not in the same place. There has to be something that's in a different place than the gas. Okay? And there's a huge number of observations that are now telling us this basic fact about that 85% of the universe is essentially not in the normal stuff that we interact with in our daily lives, 85% of the mass. And we call it cold dark matter. Um, the reason we call it cold, cold basically means something that's slow with respect to the speed of light. We think that this cold dark matter is most likely a, an actual particle, like the particles in the standard model of particle physics, except for this one isn't in the standard model. It's potentially more massive or has some other properties um, so that make that we, that we haven't detected it yet besides its gravitational effects. Um, so there's a large number of observations that indicate this. Um, those were just two of them. So this is the picture that we are left with today um, of what is the universe made of. Okay, so just I've talked actually about both of these pieces now in just a tiny bit of detail. So 
only about 4% of the universe, as, as, that we, as we now understand it, is in anything that's on the periodic table. Anything that's in atoms, anything that's in the standard model of particle physics, that makes up about 4%. And only a tenth of that is in stars. So the stars that we see are actually just a tiny fraction of this total picture. Most of the mass is this stuff called dark matter, and I'll be talking more about how this dark matter behaves as we go on. And then there's something even stranger called dark energy, which is not mass at all. It doesn't, um, it doesn't interact gravitationally in the same way as mass. So matter pulls things together. Whatever this dark energy stuff is, it's pushing things apart. Okay. So. So the state of affairs that we're in right now is, is, is a very sort of exciting but challenging one. Right? Our entire picture, really, of, of what the universe is made of has changed in the last 10 or 15 years. When I started graduate school, we did not know these numbers. And we now know these numbers to better than 10%. But despite the fact that we know how much of these various pieces there are, we don't know very much about 95% of the universe. Okay. So I tried to sort of summarize our ignorance here. As I'll try to explain to you, we actually know quite a bit about what dark matter does, about how it behaves. But we have no idea what particle it is. We don't know what it is, but we know how it behaves. The, the part here in the 4%, we're, we're pretty sure what that stuff is. It's mostly, mostly hydrogen and helium gas, a little bit of heavier elements a little bit of the stuff that makes up you and me. So we know what that is. But it turns out that the physics there is actually quite complicated. And it involves a lot, of, um, a lot of difficult things like hydrodynamics and star formation. And so even though we know what this part is, it turns out that their behavior in evolution actually requires understanding a lot of complex interactions over a really vast range of scales, from the things that are relevant you know, for forming stars in molecular clouds, all the way to the entire size of the universe. So this is actually, even though it's the piece we know what it is, it's almost the hardest piece. Dark energy, we know almost nothing about, <laughs> except for how much there is and the fact that it seems to be accelerating the universe. Okay? So this is the challenge that we're faced with um, right now in, in cosmology. And it's really fairly exciting, I think. Um, we made a ton of progress in the last decade, but there's still very big puzzles. So I wanted to just set the stage here with this picture um, of sort of the entire history of the universe in, in four little blobs. Um, so this, this first uh, thing here that happens in the first tiny fraction of a second, we think that there's a process which we call inflation. The key aspect of this for what we're going to talk about today is that somehow inflation generates all of this clumpiness that we see. Somehow all of the fluctuations in the density field at early times are generated in this first tiny fraction of a second. We now have this picture 400,000 years after the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background. That's because it's light in the microwave. This light is currently just about just under three degrees. And what this is, says last scattering here, that's because that's the t it is the time when the photons decoupled from atoms. And before that time, there was, it was basically a dense fog, and the photons just kept running into each other. After that time, photons, basic light particles, could travel to us. And we now have this very precise picture um, of, of what the universe looked like at that time. The first stars, we think, started about 200 million years after the Big Bang, so actually quite early. And now we're about 13.7 billion years into this story. And those tiny fluctuations have somehow been amplified to this picture that we see today. So in my research, sort of answering the question of what physicists do, two of the biggest questions that I'm personally interested in is, one, how do galaxies form? Right? How do we get that first beautiful picture that I showed you today? 
um, with, with all of its diversity. And one of the key things is that because most of the mass in the universe is dark, you need to understand this dark matter piece first. It's really the framework in which everything happens. It's really critical for understanding all of the physical processes that govern galaxy formation. And then the second big question that I'm interested in is, what is all this dark stuff? We kind of know how much there is, but we don't really know what 95% of the universe is, besides these names we have for it, dark matter and dark energy. And I'm particularly interested in trying to figure out how we use the bright side, essentially the visible galaxies um, that we see in the universe as probes of these two dark pieces. And one of the key pieces of the puzzle for answering both of these questions is how are mass and light connected? And there's lots of different ways to get at that question. Lots of different ways on lots of different scales. And I'm primarily a theorist. I do simulations and models. Um, but really, it's the interplay between our theoretical models and our simulations and observations, in particular, from very large galaxy surveys that have just sort of gotten up and running in the, in the last decade and are really going to be um, continuing in the next decade as we go forward. That interplay, connecting these two pieces, is where I think we're really going to make progress on both of these questions. So it's a, it's a very exciting and data-rich time in this field. So the first step in answering this question is in trying to understand how does the mass distribution evolve, OK? So this is a pretty difficult, although hopefully I'll have time to explain to you why it's not an impossible question observationally. Um, but so let's first look at the theoretical uh, understanding of how the mass distribution evolves. So it turns out that as questions go, this one's actually comparably easy com compared to the other ones we're trying to solve because we actually now know to pretty high precision what the initial conditions for this problem are. And we know the basic physics. Okay? The basic physics is gravity. Okay? And we now have measurements of the initial conditions. So this picture that I showed you already essentially gives us what the universe looks like 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And this is to pretty much all we need to know for figuring out how this whole game got started. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, we still don't quite understand the process that generated these. We think it's this thing called inflation. We're trying to understand how it generated these kinds of fluctuations. But this picture actually just tells us an enormous amount about what the universe is made of. The key thing for what follows is that it tells us how big are the density fluctuations on various scales. Okay? So you can see that things are that there's lots of structure, but there does seem to be a sort of characteristic scale. OK, so in order to figure out how this proceeds, we start with these initial conditions. As I said, the main physical process that goes on for, um, for understanding the formation of structure in the universe is gravity. Okay? So dark matter, it turns out, <coughs> the, the, it's called dark because it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force. So that makes it hard to see, but it makes it a lot easier to solve. Okay? Because electromagnetism, it turns out, is messy. Gravity is actually relatively simple. Works on pretty large scales. We pretty much know how, how it behaves. And so all we need is, is essentially a really big computer. Okay? So really big. But um, we have the initial conditions. Basically, what we want to do is figure out what gravity does to those. Okay? Now, the reason you need a big computer is because it's a nonlinear problem. As things, as things get really, really dense, they, they become much more complicated. And so we do need big computers. This is a picture of my new computer at Stanford. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I'm going to show you just a few different slices of how those small fluctuations grow to become more, a more and more clustered universe under the influence of gravity. So this is just evolving the universe forward. This is very large scales. So this is a gigaparsec that I'm plotting here. A gigaparsec is um, of order a billion light years. Okay? So that's, that's 
pretty big. Um, and uh, going forward, this is when the universe was about half of its present age. And this is what the universe looks like today. You can see substantially more clustered than the first picture. And you can see that there's structure on lots of different scales. And we'll talk more about that. So one of the key features of this picture is that we can actually use information about how that clumping proceeds to figure out <coughs> something about what the universe is made of. And this is um, an old picture looking at four different cosmological models. So this was from some simulations done about 10 years ago before we knew those pieces of the pie that I showed you earlier. So this is looking at different assumptions for what makes up those pieces of the pie. In this picture, the entire pie was made up of dark matter. In this picture over here, only about a third of it was made up of dark matter and the rest, there was, there was nothing else in the rest of the pie. And so you can see, comparing these two, the more mass you have, more gravity acts, and the clumpier your universe will be, okay? And um, it turns out that what's done here is that the expansion rate of the universe is actually scaled out. And so in this picture, the effect of this dark energy is actually fairly small because the main thing that the dark energy does is to change the expansion rate. So this just gives us one indication of a tool we can use for understanding what kind of stuff is in the universe. So we can do these simulations on a wide variety of scales. So if you, if you looked very closely at that picture that I showed you, this, this here it is again, you'll see that there's structure not just on very large scales, but on a whole wide range of scales. And here I'm just showing you five different pictures. Um, from, these are from simulations just of the dark matter that we think exists in the universe looking on very different scales. This is a scale which is roughly a cluster of galaxies. Okay? The movie here, excerpted from, from here, um, is about, uh, let's see, uh, it's uh, 40 megaparsecs, so it's about, uh, well, I think on a side it's about uh, 100 million light years on a side. And you see these clumps, so I'll just zoom in and show you that movie one more time. The thing, the time we're counting down here is in billions of years. Okay, so this is what the universe looked like 11 billion years ago in this piece. 10 billion years ago, and you see structure forming more and more. Again, the ex in this in this movie, the expansion of the universe has been scaled out. So all of this time, in addition to clumping, the universe is expanding getting larger and larger. Okay. This is just four billion years ago. You can see things are much more complex. Things are merging. And what we are interested in on sort of smaller scales, on the scales of galaxies, is this competition between the expansion of the universe and gravity. Right? So it's in essence a little tug of war that you have in any place where you have a little bit more stuff to start out with, um, that stuff will pull more stuff to it. So all along in various regions, you have this tug of war between the expansion of the universe, pulling it apart, and gravity pulling it together. And in some places where you have enough density, those overdensities will grow into gravitationally bound structures and sort of decouple from the expansion. They'll stay bound once they become bound. So those are regions where the space and the mass are no longer expanding with the global Hubble flow. And then you can get lots of interesting stuff going on, like galaxies forming. So um, cosmologists talk about objects called dark matter halos. Okay, all a dark matter halo is is it's just a gravitationally bound clump of dark matter. Okay? Um, it's not it's not, it doesn't look like a ring, it's not uh, necessarily even spherical, although sort of approximately spherical, a little bit ellipsoidal. So zooming in um, on this movie that I showed you, 
is this picture here. I've drawn circles around everything that a, a cosmologist calls a dark matter halo. And there's sort of two classes of objects. One is a halo which is not inside of another dark matter halo. And the other is a halo which is inside the sort of uh, radius of another halo. So schematically, we're just talking about something that's collapsed under its own gravity. In practice, you have to come up with some way of defining that in a, in a simulation. And what is typically done is you just, you're looking for peaks in the density distribution. Okay, so you go into your density distribution, you look for the peaks, and you call, um, basically pick some threshold above which you're going to call that a bound object. Okay? So these dark matter halos are very interesting for a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons is that this, these are where we expect galaxies to form. So this is a, another movie, same physics involved, just gravity, except for now I'm, I've zoomed in just quite a bit more than I was zoomed in the first um, picture. So this is a, a movie of the formation of a galaxy cluster, a cluster with lots and lots of galaxies. And you can see these clumps coming in. You saw a big merger there. And this is a basic feature of this kind of dark matter called cold dark matter. The basic feature is that in this kind of universe, which we're pretty sure we live in, small things form first, and then those small things merge and grow to become larger things. So here on the left is actually a plot from my PhD thesis where I studied the statistics of the buildup of these dark matter halos. I'll just show you that movie again. So what's shown here is time going down this way. I wrote it as expansion scale factor. That's because the universe is expanding this whole time. But you can just think of this as time. And so this is about half the age of the universe here in this, in this movie. And you can see there are lots of little things. And those little things merged to become this much larger thing. There's a, there's a very cool merger there. You can see there's lots of substructure. So this is one of the very interesting things about cold dark matter is that there's just lots of substructure. And, and so with these simulations, we can study the clustering of these things. So this is a plot of what's called the power spectrum of cold dark matter. It's just the Fourier transform of the clustering of dark matter. And this is a, one, a, a relatively easy way to see how things grow. This basically measures the clustering on different scales at early times and coming forward to late times. And the solid lines here are predictions if it stays in the linear regime. When, when things become nonlinear, when things sort of collapse into dark matter halos, then it diverges here. And that happens from starting from small, small scales and going out to larger scales. So that's what we can do with these simulations. Um, so this is my one slide introduction to galaxy formation theory. Okay. So the basic idea is those small fluctuations that you saw um, in that initial distribution. At that time, basically imagine that we live in a pretty simple universe where there's just this dark matter stuff and gas, which is mostly hydrogen. Okay. At, the, at early times, these two components are very well mixed. Okay. And they both have these small fluctuations. Once the gravity wins over on that tug of war, then gas can start to collapse in the centers of these dark matter halos. Okay? And the key difference, as I, as I already described, the key difference between dark matter and gas is that gas cools and radiates heat, whereas dark matter doesn't. So the dark matter sort of stays there. It's in, it's in so-called virial equilibrium, where it's the kinetic energy of the dark matter that's keeping it, um, that's keeping it uh, counteracting gravity, whereas the gas is, is instead is in pressure equilibrium from the collisions of the particles. And because it radiates heat, that gas sinks to the center uh, of the dark matter halo and forms a galaxy. So the basic thing that you should take away here is that we expect a galaxy to form at the center of each of these peaks in the dark matter distribution. Okay? Each peak that's at least massive enough to form stars. Potentially, if you have a very small peak, 
you won't be able to get enough cooling and you won't be able to get star formation. Okay, so I've described how we can simulate the distribution of matter in the universe. Now let's talk a little bit about the distribution of light. Okay, so that's something we can go out and measure with very large surveys. And this is a game that actually started in the 80s with um, the first, first redshift surveys that, that measured not just the positions of galaxies on the sky, but also how far away they were from us. But it's really been revolutionized by a few surveys in the last uh, five or 10 years. So shown here is a picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this was a survey um, of a fairly large portion of the sky. So um, almost, uh, almost a quarter of the sky um, measured about 100 million galaxies, at least measured their colors for about 100 million galaxies, and measured redshifts or measured positions away from us for about almost a million galaxies. And so this is a picture of what the distribution of those galaxies looks like in space. You can actually see, if you, if, you, if you squint hard enough, you can see a lot of the same kinds of features that we saw in the dark matter uh, simulations that I showed you earlier. So this is one example of, uh, of one of these surveys. Um, just mentioned two other future surveys that I'm involved in because these are just examples of some of the just amazing wealth of data that, we're, that is still coming, that's going to be coming in the next five to ten years. So one that I'm involved in is called the Dark Energy Survey. This is going to be a survey of about an eighth of the sky that should measure about 300 million galaxies. Looking at galaxies, mostly focused on galaxies out to redshift one, which is about half of the current age of the universe, so about seven billion years ago. But actually we'll detect some brighter galaxies all the way out to at least a hundred, uh, at least, a, at least a billion years after the Big Bang. Yeah? What is GRIZ photometry? Oh, sorry about that. So what that is, is that means taking a picture of a galaxy. That's what photometry means. Taking a picture of a galaxy, and the, the letters refer to the wave band of light that you're trying to capture. Okay? So if you, if you have a spectrum, if you have a spectrum of a galaxy, and I'll have some kind of galaxy, and we'll know that I'm not an observer by my bad spectrum here. Um, so this is a spectrum of a galaxy with wavelength going this way. So the UGRIZ refers to putting a filter over this spectrum of light and capturing all the light in a specific wavelength range. So that's the idea. You can actually get a lot of information about <coughs> about a galaxy, both about the ages of its stars and also actually about how old it is and where it is in the sky if you have accurate enough photometry. Um, so this, this uh, survey, dark energy survey, is going to attempt to measure properties of this dark energy that I told you about um, using several different methods. And, it, and depending on how much time I have, I'll, I'll talk about some of these. Um, and um, as, an, as another survey that I just want to mention, is being done by a lot of people in California, Davis. Uh, the camera is actually being built at Stanford. Um, and this will be a 2,000 square degree survey. That 2,000 square degrees will actually be imaged every three days. So it's really an amazing amount of data. I actually just heard the amazing fact that the data that should be collected from LSST will be more than the entire amount of data that currently exists, period, over all of human history. <laughs> So it's, enor it's an enormous amount of data, lots of challenges, um, but lots of excitement. <coughs> Dark energy is one of the main targets for this, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, there's lots of other science that will be done, um, including understanding galaxies, um, finding variable objects because of this three-day um, piece. And I actually, I think maybe you had a, had a lecture about this earlier in the term. So let me say a few words more about dark energy and what do we know about it? Well, basically not, not a whole lot. 
we know that something is, is accelerating the universe. That, that is fairly observationally solid. And we know sort of how much total stuff there is doing that acceleration. Okay, we know what is that contribution to the pi diagram. That number is now known to better than 10%. Okay? So we know how much there is. We know it's accelerating. So matter cannot do that. Matter cannot accelerate the universe. We know this thing is repulsive instead of attractive. So you can think of that as something that has negative pressure. We think that it's sort of approximately smoothly filling space um, and that it's approximately constant. Okay? It's not changing rapidly. Um, but figuring out the details of these two things is actually key. So if you imagine sort of a constant energy that space itself has, it's a very strange thing, so if you can't imagine it, I won't blame you. But imagine space itself having sort of a constant energy and pushing everything away. That constant energy uh, will then create a constant rate of expansion. Okay? And so that leads to an acceleration. So just a few more things. So since we, since we don't really know a whole lot else, there's not... There's not really a lot of great ideas about what's causing this. Okay? So actually the first idea for what's causing this um, was actually written down by Einstein shortly after he wrote down his original equations for general relativity. And um, he wrote down something called the cosmological constant, which had exactly this, this, uh, th these, th this uh, factor, right? That, that basically it was a constant energy of space-time. And the reason he wrote that down was actually because he wrote down GR, general relativity, before he knew that the universe was expanding. And he realized that if you had a universe with matter in it, it couldn't just sit there. Right? And at that time, everyone thought we lived in a static universe. So he actually wrote down this term in order to sort of get rid of the expansion of the universe. Um, but it's generically allowed. And... Uh, and it, this could be the answer. In fact, all of our current observations are fully consistent with something that looks like a cosmological constant. This W minus 1 relates to the so-called equation of state of dark energy, which relates the density to the pressure. Okay? So this is, as I said, we need to sort of ask these basic questions. This is sort of the most basic formula you could write down about this stuff. And this will tell you how it behaves. This will tell you what it does to the expansion rate of the universe. Okay? So another idea you might have for what this stuff could be is that it could be that quantum fluctuations in empty space, in the vacuum, um, actually create some energy density. And that's perfectly plausible. In fact, in, in a lot of particle physics theories, you expect these quantum fluctuations to be creating um, to create, be creating some pressure. But it turns out if you sort of write down how much it should be, it gives you a number that's 10 to the 160. Whereas, remember, the number we measured, this is in the same units, the number we measured was 0.7. Okay? So that's a long way from 10 to the 160. And so for a long time before this was actually measured to be 0.7, Particle physicists are kind of tricky. They like to cancel out infinity. So they said, well, that number's too big. Let's call it zero. <laughs> but now we know it's not zero. A question in the back. Yeah, I just wondered at what distances dark energy becomes evident. It becomes evident at about rate of one. So it's about seven billion years ago. Yeah, it's about half the, half the age of the universe is, is when it ends up dominating. Okay. So the, the very, it's, this is actually one of the big questions, um, one of the big puzzles about dark energy is why is it sort of similar to the amount of matter? Then, you know, in the, on the scale of things, 0.3 is actually pretty similar to 0.7. And the reason that's strange is because this dark energy stays constant with time, whereas the matter, because the universe is expanding, is actually going down with time. So at some point, roughly about half the age of the universe, the dark energy ends up dominating. So this plot here just shows the current experimental constraints um, showing what we know about this equation of state of dark energy. So this is the amount of 
dark matter, this omega matter, this is just that piece of the pie that I showed you before where that was about 25%, 22%. And this is this uh, equation of state. So cosmological constant, Einstein's original thing, would give you this number of minus one. And our current, current uh, things are fully consistent with that. So basically the challenge over the next decade, well, the real challenge is to come up with some good ideas for what this is. But short of that, the, other, the challenge is just to measure it. Figure out what is it doing over the history of time. Okay? And so the main things that it affects, dark energy affects the expansion rate of the universe. Okay? It's, that was, remember, what was initially measured right, was the expansion rate, um, just like measuring Hubble's constant, essentially. Um, but it also affects the growth rate of cosmological structure. So the growth rate, right, and, and that's by, all I mean there is sort of how fast does that picture I showed you become clumpy, okay? And that's something that I know quite a bit about. So just a, a few more details, um, and don't worry about the, the jargon on here, but there's, there's, there's basically two main ways, as I just said, you want to measure the expansion rate, and one way of doing that is by trying to find a standard candle, okay? Just trying to essentially make that same plot that we saw of the distance versus redshift. Supernovae is one example. There are other possible things that can do this. Um, the other possibility is to find a standard ruler. Instead of finding something that's a fixed brightness, find something that's a fixed size, okay? That can tell you the same, same thing about what's the expansion rate. And then the other possibility is to measure the growth of structure. There's two main ways to measure the growth of structure. One is by looking at that structure on very large scales, okay? By, for example, measuring how galaxies cluster on very large scales. And another is to, instead of looking at large scales, look at the peaks. Look at the peaks of the distribution and see how fast they clump. And it turns out that's a, that's a really, it's a very sensitive way to do this. So the rate of clumping over time is a function of the mass distribution. And the number of clumps sort of per unit volume is a function of how much the universe expands. So measuring both of these things together can give us constraints on both of these dark pieces that we talked about, dark matter and dark energy. So the first step is in trying to make this connection between mass and light. Okay? And I won't have time really to get into the details of any of these methods, but feel free to ask me more about them. I'll just sort of briefly outline all three of these. So one way of trying to connect mass and light um, sort of observationally is to measure the abundance and clustering of galaxies. You can, we now have these large surveys where we can do that. And then we have these large simulations, which I've just shown you where we can measure the abundance and clustering of these dark matter halos. Okay. And we can use those two pieces of information to see how the two pieces are connected. Now you might be wondering at this point, why don't I just try to form the galaxies in my simulation? Why am I just sticking with the dark matter? And the basic reason is we're just not very good at it yet. <laughs> um, people are trying, and the, basically the way to do that is to put all of the baryons, all of the atoms, all of the gas and the stars into your simulation as well, not just the dark matter. Um, and people are doing that, but it's very, very computationally challenging. And there's basically, although the basic physics is, is just hydrodynamics, there's a lot of complex interactions. You're trying to resolve scales all the way down from, again, sort of the molecular clouds in which stars form to the entire universe. And it's just not currently a solvable problem. So I'm going to stick to the problem that we know how to solve, which is measuring the clustering of the dark matter, and actually comparing it to what's observed. Another way of, of getting at this is to look at the peaks in the distribution. Turns out there's a lot of stuff happening in the peaks. You actually saw that in the movies that we looked at. And basically, you can see how the galaxies are related to those peaks. You can actually go out and find them. You can, you can connect them. And it turns out, those peaks, as I mentioned, are very, very sensitive to the properties of this dark energy. Um, another way is through something called weak gravitational lensing. 
So this is actually a way to measure the mass distribution itself. And I already actually showed you a picture from weak lensing in, in the third slide of the talk. Um, the basic idea here is that GR tells you that mass actually distorts space. So if you have a big clump of mass and you're looking at stuff behind it, that stuff will get just a little bit distorted. Move it, it, the space around that mass will, uh, will be a little bit distorted and the light will be a little bit distorted and you can use that distortion to actually measure that mass. Okay? So in, and in each case, the key to progress on all of these things is really the interface between the kinds of simulations that I showed you and the kinds of galaxy surveys that people are doing now. So this is a, just a 3D version of that same, uh, essentially that same distribution of galaxies we saw before from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you'll, each tiny little point in this plot is an actual galaxy whose position on the sky has been measured and whose distance away from us has been measured. So first of all, it's just a kind of a phenomenal achievement that, oops, that we actually have these kinds of measurements. Um, but the first thing that you notice is that these things are not sort of randomly distributed in space. They're, they're quite clustered. Okay? And um, there's lots of different ways to measure the clustering. So I'm just going to briefly talk about two ways of measuring the clustering. One is something that we call a correlation function. So what's shown here is just the probability of, if I have a distribution of points, the probability of measuring a pair as a function of its separation. So what this plot is telling you is that on small scales, things are much clumpier than they are on large scales. That's the main result here. The other thing you can do is just go and count the massive objects. And this is what happens if you do that in dark matter simulation. This is the number of dark matter clumps as a function of their mass. And one of the important thing to notice here is actually that this is sort of a power law here, and that at some point it gets really steep. It gets exponentially steep. And it turns out how that happens has exponential sensitivity also to the kinds of stuff we have in the universe, to what, how much dark matter and dark energy we have. So measuring both of these things can, can um, put really good limits on what cosmology is made of, or what, what the universe is made of. So it turns out that galaxies sort of, light doesn't trace mass in an unbiased fashion. You don't always have light where you have mass, just like you don't always have snow where you have land. Okay? And in this case, basically we have a situation where you have more light, galaxies are brighter, in deeper potential wells. Okay? So the, the, deeper, the deeper your density fluctuation is, the more stuff you can get in there. Just like if you get more snow on the tops of mountains than you do in the foothills. And it turns out that the peaks are actually clustered with each other actually in a very similar way to the fact that you have mountain ranges. Okay? So that fact actually means that the, the galaxies themselves are clustered in a different way than the mass distribution. So don't, don't worry about the formula, but the main point is that brighter galaxies are more clustered than dimmer galaxies. And we can use that to trace this out and figure out how they're related to the dark matter. Turns out that those dark matter clumps are actually themselves a little bit biased with respect to the underlying distribution. And basically, the idea here is imagine just fluctuations on two separate scales. Fluctuations on some very large scale, and then smaller fluctuations put on top of that. Basically, we get galaxies at, those, at the very high peaks. Just like I said, you need sort of a, enough density to get a galaxy. And so those things are more clustered than the lower density peaks. So, you can measure these things for both galaxies and dark matter halos. Just like I showed you uh, those, those dark matter halos in the, in the simulation. So you can plot the number of dark matter halos as a function of their mass, called the halo mass function. You can do something similar for galaxies. You can measure the number of galaxies as a function of their brightness. Okay? And 
Then you can look at the clustering. You can measure the clustering of galaxies as a function of their brightness, and you can measure the clustering of dark matter clumps as a function of their mass. And if you look at these two sides of the picture here, you'll see that they sort of have the same general features, pretty flat, very, very steep, and this, this one's backwards it, because it's done in magnitudes instead of luminosities, but basically you have the same thing, pretty flat, then it gets exponentially steep. But if you look hard enough, you'll see that actually they're not exactly the same. This is, this is quite a bit flatter than this. This is actually quite a bit steeper than this. And so what this is telling you actually is that galaxies and halos are very close to connected, but they're not exactly connected. They're not connected one to one. And there's a missing piece, which is how many galaxies do you have in every dark matter halo? Okay? And going back to that piece that we saw before, remember that we had all of these substructures. Um, and basically, so the missing piece here is how many galaxies are there in these halos? And, and you can actually use those two sides of the plot to tell you how these two things are connected. Question? Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually just a dark matter simulation, but what we expect is that there's a massive galaxy at the center here, and then smaller galaxies here at these other bright knots. So this we expect to correspond to basically the biggest galaxy in a cluster of galaxies. Should I, what, how much time do I have? A few minutes. A few minutes, okay. So we can actually measure this in, in dark matter simulations. We can ask how many galaxies live in a dark matter halo? And we can, we can go and measure this. We can, we can actually count it up. Basically, we find something that's actually quite simple. Every dark matter halo seems to have one clump in the center. That scales roughly as the mass of the dark matter halo. So if you have something that's 10 times as big, um, you'll, have, you'll have 10 times as many satellite galaxies, and then one extra in the center. So um, I'm running out of time, so I just want to uh, I'll, show, I'll show this plot, which shows that if we now have the, the main thing to take away from this plot, although there's, there's way too much on here for you to understand it in, in the time we have, but the main thing to take away is that we now have simulations that are large enough that we can look at very large scales and measure the clustering of objects, and we can, in the same simulation, go to small enough scales that we can resolve the halos that host galaxies. And when we do that, and then just make the simplest assumptions about how those galaxies are connected to the dark matter clumps, we actually find that we match the clustering that's observed with very high precision. And that's what's shown here in this plot. This is the same, same plot I showed before of the correlation function of galaxies as a function of scale. Small scales are more clustered than, uh, than larger scales. And you remember that bright galaxies are more clustered than dimmer galaxies. The point here is that our simulations are actually predicting that for the dark matter clumps. The red points here are, the, are data measured from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the blue points, uh, the blue line is our, uh, is our simulation. So I'm going to skip uh, through most of the rest of this, but feel free to ask me. Went too fast. So, just let me just say a few words about this method gravitational lensing, which allows us to actually measure uh, the mass distribution directly. So the basic idea is that you, if, you have, if you have some mass concentration, it will deflect the light just a little bit. And sometimes, if, if things are massive enough, it actually can create multiple images of something and really stretch things out. That's shown in this picture of a very massive cluster. But more generically, any mass in the universe can sort of just distort things a tiny, tiny bit. And this is an example, if you, had a bunch of, if you had a bunch of spherical galaxies and they were distorted through this mass distribution, you would end up with things that are not spherical anymore. They're elongated. And we can use that. So this is actually what we measure in the universe. And we can use this to actually reconstruct what is the mass distribution 
um, in the universe. So this is a very, very powerful technique. And it's something that this, this uh, shear of galaxies from weak lensing was actually only detected for the first time in, in 2000, although it was predicted much, much earlier. But it's now going to be one of the primary methods going forward for figuring out how the mass distribution is connected to the light. So I will just uh, finish there. And feel free to ask me questions about the rest. So we're in this sort of state of affairs where 95% of our universe is dark. And uh, even though we can't see it, we can use galaxies to trace what that dark side is doing. We can use it to trace the clustering. We can use it to trace the expansion rate. And we have a lot of new simulations and theoretical tools that allow us to, uh, to do this uh, connection. And uh, I'll just end there.